This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is Twiv. This Week in Virology, episode 433, recorded on March 17th, 2017. This episode of TWIV is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TWIV. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Depomier. Hello there, Vincenzo. Today is St. Patty's Day, right? It is, it is, it is. And Dixon has a green shirt on. He does, he does, he does. What the hell is this? Is well, I'm, you, you're saying that's the way Irish people talk? Well, they, 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 they tend to be a little bit sing-songy there. You know, they just, that sounds Scottish to me. They don't know. Well, I can do a Scottish <laughs> accent. I won't do it. I won't do it on the air. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I'm Irish, not yeah, Scottish. It would be a bad thing to do today. <laughs> it would be a very bad thing to do, laddie. <laughs> it's 7 degrees Celsius here in New York City, sunny. It doesn't look bad outside, but it's Chilly. cold. But yesterday was freezing, and the snow is warm. still hanging around. Also joining us today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hello, Kathy. So what's green <laughs> and sits on the back porch? Oh, patio furniture. Exactly. <laughs> what? Uh, what? <laughs> Patty O furniture. Don't Pat, you know Patty, the jokes? Boy? No, I don't know it. This is the terrible as, thing. As, as we discussed this morning, I don't do humor. It, that isn't humor. That's the truth. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's Patty O furniture. Anyway, it's 33 degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> one degree Celsius you're not, here. You're not Irish, right, Kathy? I have some Northern Irish, Irish blood. Yeah, that's, what are you that's, mainly? That's, that's where I am, too. Uh, German for the Spindler side of the family. Yeah, uh, right, right. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. What's green and goes backwards at 200 miles an hour? Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Is that, was that a booger in your nose? <laughs> that was me <laughs> inhaling sharply through my nose, yes. So the implication is that a green piece of mucus that's yes, partially Yes, goes dry. backwards at 200 miles an Does hour. Does that really go yeah. that fast? I have no idea. It's a joke, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. I like to get to the reality of things. I mean, you know? yeah. <laughs> if you're long as you're on colors, what's purple and conquered the world? Mm. Alexander the Grape. Ah. Oh, Dixon. Okay. This is so like now that we're fifth grade, you know. Now that we've run through the, the back okay. of the bus. Jokes. Yeah, but remember, Caleb is listening. So therefore, yes. uh, those... if you're celebrating St. Patrick's Day, enjoy. Be please moderate. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. Please moderate. And, <laughs> and those moderate. of you that. <laughs> that don't like the weather discussions probably don't like the jokes either. Perhaps, yeah, no, sure perhaps I don't. should tell you my Irish joke about that then. But and no, it's it's appropriate that we honor the heritage of one of the many refugee groups that made America great. Goddamn right. Yeah. You have a joke where you say two Irishmen left three, the bar. Three. Three Irishmen walk out of a bar. It could happen. Could happen. Yes. That's yeah, kind of that's but, kind of insulting. I could see yeah. people being offended. Well, not if you're Irish. <laughs> they know it's never happened. <laughs> Anyway, it's it's pretty pretty nice weather here too. By the way, it it's is five it's five C clear blue skies and right. uh, and uh, for a change, it's kind of nice. You have some snow on the ground there, right? We have about a foot of snow on mm. the ground. Um, okay. but you, and we're supposed to get a little more this weekend. Yep, exactly. that's what I heard too. Uh, the American Society for Microbiology would like you to know about the ASM Clinical Virology Symposium taking place May seventh through tenth. It's in a brand new location, Savannah, Georgia. Lovely. In May, it's not going to be too hot either. Savannah's a great, a good time. great city. CVS, as they fondly call it, is led by biomedical scientists engaged in research as well as primary care physicians and laboratorians involved with patient care. And it is a leading event covering key viral infection topics. Hence, Are they laboratorians or laboratorians? Exactly. Yeah, you could do both. I like laboratorians. <laughs> Laboratory. And uh, if you register before March 30th, you will get early bird savings for the latest updates and more information. Go to asm.org slash CVS. New. Nice. What was the new for? No, I meant to say nice. 
I missed so one. you can register, but unfortunately, abstract submission, case study submission, and travel award submissions are all closed. Did someone fall? <laughs> Sorry. Hope you're There's all- a mouse that fell off my desk. <laughs> I hope you're all right. Yeah, uh, my mouse is fine. <laughs> sometimes mice walk away, don't they? They do. <laughs> All right, we have a snippet for you, who, which was sent in by Frank, who wrote an interesting peek into our environment, which I thought was a wonderful contract. I like that. Of yes. the environment, right? It's good. Not bad. Not bad. Viroment. This is a paper published in PNAS called Rapid Evolution of the Human Gut Virome from a group at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. What is it, the city of brotherly love? Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you lived there for a while, Alan, correct? I did. I lived in Philadelphia for about three years. Is it before you came here to grad school? Um, No, it was after. uh, We, um, uh, so after, Uh, yeah, in 2000, I got married and we moved to Philadelphia for a few years. Your wife did something with medicine there, right? She did a surgery residency for three years and then decided she wanted to switch to psychiatry. Yeah, that's what doing right. surgery does to you. <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, it's funny. Now that we live in the Hartford area, a lot of our neighbors are in the insurance business. Yeah. And every time she says that, they, <laughs> they, you know, they say, oh, that was a great move. Yeah, um. yeah you got to insure yourself big time. You get sued a lot. I know my dad was a surgeon. Yeah, Surgeons have a, have a different personality from everyone else. They do, yeah. If you want to, everyone else in medicine, anyway. I, and I always say, if you find something in me that's objectionable, I'll blame my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Which sometimes draws criticism from certain quarters. You can guess who. But I once had a friend who was a psychiatrist, and she said to me, "It's always good to identify the source of your issues." So in other words, you can blame people. <laughs> You can. So psychiatrists are charged by the hour, and surgeons charge by the pound. <laughs> A pound to take out. Uh, the authors on this paper are Samuel Mino, Alexandra Bryson. Are they both co first authors? I have to be careful. They both have A's next to them. Let's see. Uh, That's just for uh, where they are. Yeah. I, I already checked. <laughs> Not first okay. authors. I just don't want Kathy to, to say they're right. You know, I'm trying to preempt. Right. It must be a very peaceful lab, too, because it says the authors declare no conflict of interest. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> Mino, Bryson, Shehu. Wu Lewis and Frederick Bushman is the PI. I've done some of his work before. Uh, and this is a study, a long term study of the viruses in your gut or actually in your feces, which Elio Schechter is always willing to point out is not the same as in your gut wall, right? But right. you can't collect the gut wall very easily. No. No. And so in this study, what they did was to uh, collect 24 stool samples from a healthy male at 16 time points over 884 days. Wow. So was this the first author or the senior author? I know, exactly. <laughs> that was my first thought on reading Or it that. could be the third or the fourth or fifth <laughs> author, right? I think it's probably either the first author or the senior author. <laughs> and if it's the senior author, you know, these, these other folks are putting up with their boss's crap all the time. Oh, so it's, a, uh, so it's an autovirome that we're talking about here? <laughs> yeah, probably. Now, here's a cool statement. For eight of the time points, two separate samples taken one centimeter apart. Now, one centimeter is not a measure of time, as far as I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I was thinking in the car this morning how this was done, because, you know, if you put these samples in a container, they're going to get kind of mushed up, right? So one of these authors probably would they collect had to it. them. And chop it up I'm right away, right? I'm pretty sure that when you collect them, you freeze them. Oh, you freeze them right away. So yes. That, so that's how they can avoid them getting all mushed up. Yes. As long as you freeze them right away. Because you can imagine that someone might not. But yeah, I if guess. If you were collecting these at home, you, you would freeze would them. Freeze them. Well, parasitologists go through this <laughs> all the time. This is called a sampling error. So you have to you have to take samples from various places on that stool sample in order to gain a representative Yeah, for this study, sample. you want to freeze them. Although when you take samples to the clinical lab, you don't necessarily freeze them. No. No. Right. No, anyway, I worked in the clinical lab one summer. We would just get a cup with a smear of, well, Oh, you're right. So uh, they t- they purified virus-like particles, so they didn't want to just do total sequencing because you would get a lot of stuff that's non-viral and make mm, it harder. A lot of crap. <laughs> You'd have to subtract it. Mm. And so these are mainly DNA viruses. They purify DNA and amplify it. 
So they said, we made no attempt to study gut RNA viruses, which we know exist, although some of the samples were dominated by abundant plant RNA viruses. See, I was going to ask with food. I was definitely <laughs> yep. going to ask that question. What were you going to ask? That how much of it is you and how much of it is what you've just eaten? Yeah, well, you the, are, yeah, they're the same thing. You are what you eat. <laughs> if their method didn't involve isolating RNA, then how did they get RNA viruses? Yeah, I know. Hmm. I know. It's a good question, Kathy. It's, yeah, no attempt was made to study, but we know that some samples were dominated by them, so I don't know. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Kathy. That's a good question. They They do talk about looking at levels of contaminating human DNA using... Well, that's just qPCR. They're still not talking about yeah, RT-qPCR. So, yeah, I don't know. Oh, well. Anyway, they see, they analyzed the DNA sequences. They had a lot of sequences, 56 billion bases from these 24 samples. And they identified 478 well-determined contigs, which are longer sequences that you can piece together from these shorter reads. And they're mainly bacteriophages, microviridae, podoviridae, myoviridae, and siphoviridae. However, the known ones were only 13% of all the sequences. The rest, dark matter. All be, uh, no uh, pun intended. <laughs> yes. Brown matter. No, it's yes. just unknown stuff, which is fascinating, right? That's so much huh. in your gut over this, you know, multi-year period. Is that it? I mean, 884 days. How many? It's almost three. It's almost three years. Assuming that he didn't eat the same thing every day. I'm sure the diet changed. Then there's lots of common ones that you should have found that could eliminate the ones from the outside from plants. Because that would vary greatly, whereas the ones within you would stay about the same. I think the plant viruses are mainly RNA. Are they? I think, but probably not. But they didn't actually mention any plant viruses. They're mostly bacteriophages here. Right. So the the most abundant contig. So again, a contig is a assembly of a number of smaller sequences to something that you can recognize, right? Or maybe not. You know, you may recognize it or not. You can still assemble it into a content. Most of them, they say, were maintained through the duration of the experiment. Interesting. And most, over 80% of the contigs were found in common between the 850-day time points. Interestingly, they found no contigs <laughs> corresponding to eukaryotic viruses. Isn't I that guess that's good news. That, yeah, I'd I say. thought that was pretty surprising. I'm surprised. Now, that Which is. ones would you expect to see? Uh, other studies, as they show, have... Uh, like what, rotavirus or... Well, rotas or RNA viruses, so we wouldn't pick that up. I'd, I'd expect to, to find herpes viruses, small DNA viruses, maybe... Adenoviruses. Adenoviruses, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, and they say later in their discussion that other people have reported such sequences, but they, th- they think that maybe the purification methods change it, or if someone is sick, they can have more... DNA viruses in their guts, right. and, and this person was apparently healthy for three years. <laughs> sure, sure. It's a two and a half year study. Two and, two and, and a half, half years. Study. Yeah, I just. So if you got were sick and you had a let's say a pneumonia uh, that was viral, and then you swallowed the mucus and it went down through your gut tract, that would destroy the virus usually, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But of course, if you took a sample, you might see those sequences. You just in might your sample. The other thing they look at, so it's mostly phages. Um, the other thing they look at is the. Um, Substitution rate, the the change in the mm. in the viral genome mm. substitution rate over time, because they have a two and a half year study, and they can do that. Mm-hmm. And they were able to see in a particular contig how it changed over time, and they found you know rates of mutation, um, and it differed according to what kind of virus. So the single stranded DNA genomes had higher mutation rates than double stranded DNA genomes. And the lowest substitution rates were seen for temperate bacteriophages, which integrate into the host, the bacterial host. And, of course, they have a slower mutation rate because the host right. mutation rate is slower than, than viruses. And the highest mutation rates were when members of the microviridae went to 4% over the course of the experiment, more than one substitution per 105 nucleotides per day. So mm. it's, a lot, it's a lot of change. Hmm. And they basically say that uh, this is why the, the the virome is so is so dynamic. It changes over time. It becomes very different uh, at any time point. You have a community, a complex mixture of variants, uh, and new ones will accumulate with time. You know, so that's that's why your 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 gut virome is so different. They also looked at um, CRISPRs, um, which are in the hosts, right? 
uh, in the bacterial metagenome, of course, along with this viral gene. They could also sequence bacterial uh, genomes as well. And CRISPRs, of course, are, are, are arrays of pieces of incoming DNA that have been stored for defensive purposes. But you can, and they could match up the CRISPR arrays with some of their contigs, which makes sense, right? So then they could say, sure. this is the host for this phage. I think that's a pretty nice way of uh, identifying the host because otherwise you don't know what the hosts are for these particular phages. And they also had s- very small evidence for changes in CRISPR target sites over time. Mm. I also found CRISPRs and phages, which we know, we've talked about this before on, a, I think, a TWIM or maybe TWIV, I don't remember. Um, and they these CRISPRs and phages are <laughs> meant to antagonize CRISPRs in the bacterial yes. cell. But some of the CRISPRs and phages antagonize CRISPRs and other phages. Is it getting too complicated, Dixon? It's a a hall of mirrors. (laughs) It is. It's the infinity room by Yoyoma Usama. You're barbering seeing yourself forever. It's like idiotype, anti-idiotype, anti-anti-idiot, et cetera. (laughs) So basically what we have here is we have um, a lot of viruses in your gut. What's the number here? 10 to the ninth virus-like particles per gram of feces. Lord. That's a lot. That is. Billions. That's right. More than 9,000. They change extensively. In fact, they say in this paper that the rate of change, the amount of change is enough over the course of this experiment to make a new species. Because <laughs> sometimes right. species only differ by 3 or 4%. So we're sitting here, Dixon, making new species. As we that. sit. As we sit. <laughs> and make sure you say sit. <laughs> yes. And he, they say, uh, we can return to the question of why human gut viromes differ so greatly about uh, between individuals, which is what people have observed yeah. before. And one factor must be the differences in bacterial populations. So although the gut has bacteria from only a few phyla, the strains are mostly different between individuals, and therefore the viruses are going to be different as well. And that's one factor. And the other is, of course, the extreme variation within Post evolution that they showed up to four percent substitution, and so uh, that would account for why your gut virome is different from mine and Alan's and Kathy's and everyone else on Earth in health and in sickness. <laughs> in sickness. Now, one thing for I, better or worse. I, I wondered why they didn't find any archaeal viruses because we know our gut has archaea in it, and um, there, there are DNA viruses there. I don't know why we wouldn't see them. And, you know, the, UK, the lack of eukaryotic viruses is puzzling and unfortunate. But this certainly brings um, to the fore the term deep sequencing. <laughs> <laughs> You're in deep sequencing, Dick, so you have to be careful. <laughs> That's exactly how we should put that from now on. You're in deep That's sequencing. That's right. We have some deep sequencing. And this, this mirrors what you see in studies of um, the bacterial microbiome. Yep. Yes. Um, so you see an, a... a Significant degree of stability over relatively long time periods in an individual, uh, a lot of difference between individuals, but then there's also this turnover um, over time, and sometimes it can be significant turnover, so the phages are reflecting that. Yeah. Now, the thing here is, of course, um, if you put together this with the study we did uh, many twivs ago, Baby's First Virome. Uh, right. right. It's yeah, Kathy's formal, former student, right? Is that uh-huh. correct? Undergrad. Mm-hmm. Undergrad. Ephraim Lim. Now that, we, we learned that the baby acquires the virome from the mother by drinking the amniotic fluid, and that includes bacteriophages, and that shapes your, back, your microbiome for the first uh, months in a year of life. Astounding. And then eventually you get to a certain point. Kathy, in that study, did they find eukaryotic viruses? Do you remember? Because I don't remember. Yes, I'm virtually certain they did. You're virtually certain? Yeah. Is, that, is that like but, not I, real, but computer? Are yeah. certain? <laughs> I will check. I hate she's, to be wrong. She's hologram so, certain. <laughs> so I'm hedging my bets. Because they say in this paper, uh, several studies have reported frequent detection of animal cell viruses in metagenomic analysis of stool DNA from humans and other primates. And that's where they have 34, 35, 36. Um, 34, 35. That's not, it's not uh, your, your study there. Not yours, but your undergraduates. So there's some differences which are curious. The curious case of no eukaryotic viruses. <laughs> so they did, from birth to two years of age, the eukaryotic virome and the bacterial microbiome expanded. 
Mm. And this was accompanied right. by a contraction of and shift in the bacteriophage virome composition. So they did see eukaryotic viruses so I, in I would the guess, babies. I guess it's a methodological difference. Yeah. Yeah. But we, well, are, and this, we are a moving target. <laughs> yeah. And this paper that we're talking about is from 2013, and the baby's first virome paper is from 2015. So in the intervening time, the methodology may have changed with that, yep, with respect right. to that too. But the bottom line here is that we have a ton of no, bacterial virus. <laughs> Dixon, stop it. We have a ton of bacterial viruses in our gut, which are growing on our microbiome. We do. And, um, you know, your microbiome is different from mine, so my your that virome is different everything. from mine. No, well, it doesn't explain everything. <laughs> Do you I mean, think we'll ever paper, get a... I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't. Uh, this paper is open access, by the way. <laughs> right. Do you think we'll ever get to the point where we can do real-time analysis uh, within, let's say, minutes uh, to see how these changes come about with regards to deep sequencing, maybe, for instance, automated sequencing that's implanted that gives you a readout. And, <laughs> no, no, I'm serious about that. Because I understand what you're saying. You yeah. want to watch it happen. You don't want to just take these snippets, uh, look, as you would call it. Well, I, I guess if your that. lab is sufficiently flush with funds. Uh, yes. Dixon, uh, right now you can wear a watch that'll tell you your temperature, blood pressure, you know, glucose level, you know, and all that real you know, time. Eventually, I'm going to have a virus watch for sure. If someone... Ask All of which can it. be subpoenaed, by the way. That's fine. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. true. That is true. Hmm. But if you can imagine it, then you can do it. Yeah. I think, I think it would be very interesting. Now, um, I'm really interested in the 90, 87% that is unknown. I mean, I would And as this. people sure. do more and more sequencing, that theoretically should get smaller and smaller. Right? I'd like to see these two astronauts put next to each other right now and see what they found on that one. What the twins, astronauts? there's twins. One of them spent a year in space, okay. don't you remember? Yeah, yeah. Sure. And they just mm -hmm. finished a National Geographic one. I mean, actually, it was a Nova. And, um, you know, it explained how, you know, he was really, um, at some point, he was getting very depressed around uh, the seventh month. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually, you still have five more months to go before you go home. Yeah. And, you know, he could talk to his daughter, for instance, and he could talk to his wife. And he said one of the things he missed the most was just listening to rainfall. So she took her iPhone outside and recorded about a half hour worth of rain, and she sent it up mm. to him to listen to. Yeah, rain is kind of nice on the roof. It right? is, it is. Yeah. But but imagine how different these two guys' microbiomes are. Yeah, sure. Even if they were different before, now they're really different. Yeah, so that was Scott and Mark Kelly. Yeah, that's right. And nice people, too. They seem like a very, very together uh, set of twins and really uh, supportive and that sort of thing. Very, uh, very warm. I think uh, it's nice to think of all the phages in your gut. <laughs> all right? it's, if you're listening to this episode, you know, you, now you know when just sitting around, if you have nothing else to do, think about all those viruses infecting cells on a, exactly. every minute in your gut. It's amazing. Isn't it? You can ruminate on that. You can ruminate so, on that. But don't get know. phased out of it. So there you go, Frank. That's your Viromint. There you go. Yeah. This episode of, on your Viromint is brought to you by Blue Apron. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting high standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. Pretty lofty goals there, wouldn't you say, I'd Dixon? Say, I'd say, yeah. I hope they succeed. So sustainable means it will go on forever? Well, no, that isn't what that means What does it all. mean? What does it mean? It means... Something different, no matter what you say, sustainable about. I mean, it's it's got no definition, so it's kind of a well, in terms of term. a food system. What does it mean? I think it means that as long as they're in business, I think that's what sustainable <laughs> means. <Okay. laughs> what they do is deliver seasonal recipes along with the fresh, high quality ingredients you need to make delicious home cooked meals. Every meal comes with a recipe card with step by step instructions, nice pictures too, and pre portioned ingredients. Hmm. Forty minutes or less, you have. A hot meal on your table. Give you everything except salt, pepper, and oil. Mm -hmm. And my son just was educating himself on food. He told me no vegetable oil. He said really? the best oil is, really? do you know what the best oil is? Canola. No. Canola? That's, that's vegetable, vegetable oil. oil. Coconut oh, oil. Has the right omega oh, fatty acids. Yeah. Doesn't it break down when you cook with it? Uh, at a certain temperature. You keep it below it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it was amazing. Coconut oil. Even, even for deep frying? I don't think deep frying would work, no. No, no, because I deep fry in canola oil. You could deep fry shrimp, coconut shrimp, and coconut. Right, oil. Anyway, <laughs> you can use the oil of anyway. your choice. 
And if you spend a lot eating out or at high-end grocery chains, you can now <laughs> expect to spend under $10 a person for healthy home-cooked meals. That's pretty good. That is very good. So a meal for two twenty dollars without alcohol, but that's pretty cheap, and it's great stuff. It's delicious. It's fresh, high quality, right. and you've made it yourself. The reason is they don't have stores. They get their material direct from producers all over the USA, mm -hmm. and so you know, not having brick and mortar really saves you a lot of money. I'll say they have a community of over 150 farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the U.S., which is good. They're, they're providing employment as well. They are. They get seafood under standards developed together with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. They say sourced sustainably, which means you take and more will come, right? That's, hopefully that is exactly what In other words, you don't get to a point where all the fish are gone at some point. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> Beef, chicken, and pork from responsibly raised animals. Produce from farms that practice regenerative farming. So these are outdoor farms, it sounds like. And so you regenerate the land after you've farmed it, right? You try. And because they ship exactly what you need, they're reducing food waste. And I feel that it's great because you don't overeat. You got a portion, you have a portion, and that's it. There's no more. <laughs> <laughs> and customize your recipes every week depending on your dietary preferences, your timing. You don't have to have any, something every week. You can have it you know, special occasions, and there's no weekly commitment. They have a, a variety of things throughout the year, and they never repeat, so uh, you won't get bored. So y yesterday on TWIM, I went over to blueapron.com. Today we'll do TWIV, and we'll see what's on the menu, because they have lovely pictures here of uh, what's on the menu. Okay, so you can look at two- or four-person meals, but we have chicken ramen with greens, Soft boiled eggs and miso broth. Mm. Wow. That, that sounds very good. That's just one of them. And they also have salmon piccata with orzo and broccoli. What's orzo, Dickinson? It turns out to be pasta, but we <laughs> all thought it was rice. <laughs> Pork chops with miso, and miso butter with bok choy and marinated apple. Vegetable chili and baked sweet potatoes with crispy tortilla strips. Check out this week's menu and you will get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping. Go to blueapron.com slash twiv. That is blueapron.com slash twiv. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And when there are delivery issues, such as this week, because of the ah, blizzard in the east, right. they send you plenty of notice that your shipment will be delayed, but they're tracking it. I was supposed to get mine on Wednesday, and I'm going to get it tonight when I get home. You mean the minute rice will be a little late? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Are you going to cook it tonight or tomorrow? Uh, well, I have three meals and I probably won't cook one any of them tonight. Mm. But, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Of course, Kathy only has a 10 minute commute. Right. right. <laughs> how how yeah. envious am I? Not and you too, Dixon. I have a very strong. And Alan has a 30 second commute. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> uh, dear, dear, dear. My but on average, choice. we have a 45-minute <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a paper, a really interesting paper. We do, we do. Which combines viruses and worms. I love and Dixon it. Dixon is so excited because we're talking about worms. He's Even these are not the kind that make you sick. It's okay. Dixon, Cino rhabditis elegans, is what kind of a worm? It's a soil nematode. Nematode, not nematode. No, nematode. It's a nematode. And has no segments, right? Correct. And tell me a pathogenic nematode. Strongyloides stercoralis. Wow, that just flows off your tongue. How about that? Decatur. What does strongyloides tell you? Is it uh, causing you? <laughs> Diarrheal disease. Good. And we have done that on TWIP, haven't we? Yep. This paper is in Current Biology. The antiviral RNA interference response provides resistance to lethal arbovirus infection and vertical transmission in Cenorhabditis elegans. And we have two co-first authors. Don well, Gammon and Takao Ishidate. I love pronouncing Japanese words. And my son is taking <laughs> Japanese in college, so he nice. teaches me. Nice. Li Chao Li, Wei Feng Gu, Neil Silverman, and Craig Mello from UMass, University of Massachusetts in Worcester. Worcester. Worcester, Worcester. Worcester, that's right. Department Worcester. of Cell Biology and Neuroscience at, at UC Riverside. And one of the authors is at U, U Texas Southwestern in Dallas. Now, not only is Dixon excited because it's a worm. Kathy's excited because it's BSV. <laughs> hey. Right. We, right. We, we satisfied two we got a hit. co hosts today. <laughs> now, Craig Mello uh, is very well known for getting a Nobel Prize 
for the discovery of RNA interference, which he did in worms. Did you know that, Dixon? Wow. No? I think I know. I knew it at the time, of course. I've, I filed that one back of, in my Rolodex someplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobel Prize in Always Physiology or Medicine 2006 nice. for the discovery nice. of nice. RNA interference, along with Andy Fire. Mm hmm. And I have to tell you, when I was a postdoc at MIT, Andy, which is from 1975 to 79, is that right? No, no, 79 to 82. Hmm. Uh, Andy Fire was a a bloody graduate student <laughs> in Phil Sharp's lab, and he gets the Nobel Bloody Prize. It's like in his or 40s. David Baltimore was a graduate student when I was a postdoc at um, Rockefeller. <laughs> ah, same thing. And he got his in the 40s also. Yeah. Wow. All right, so what is this about? So everyone should know that C. elegans has been a wonderful model system for studying all kinds of molecular biology, neurology, developmental biology. What else, Dixon? Um, all right, you don't know, but a lot of things, a lot of labs study it. There's, there are a specified number of cells. We know the exact lineage where we each do. one comes from. We do. You can genetically modify it. Can yep. knock out genes. Yep. Can do a lot of stuff. It's the only worm that I know of that's been sequenced sequentially. Uh, seg <laughs> I'm sorry, sectioned sequentially for electron microscopy mm. from end to, mm. to end. You can put it all together like a movie if you want. You know, flip the pictures. And this is and now. This is a small. We're not talking about uh, night crawlers here. No, no, this no, is no, a. No, no. This is a small worm. It's not quite microscopic. Right. You can right. see it with the naked eye, but about the size of a pinworm. Yeah, in order to see any of the structures, you put it under a microscope. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that helps me, Dixon, about the but, size of a pin. You know, I yes, could say about, about the size, the size of, of New Jersey, but I mean, that's another uh, You're, in a, you're yeah. in a nasty boot today. <laughs> no, I'm uh, good so me. they're interested in the antiviral RNAi, RNA interference response, right. which, of course, Mello got his Nobel Prize for, for studying in C. elegans. Mm -hmm. And so what happens which, he, when he dis, when he discovered it? Everybody said, "Oh yeah, that's interesting. It's a <laughs> weird thing that's only a skeleton. <laughs> yeah. So who cares?" Yeah, like RNA editing in trypanosomes. I understand. That's yeah. right. <laughs> now, uh, RNA interference is clearly antiviral in insects and plants. Whether it is in mammals is still, I think, debatable. There have been really? a couple of papers that have shown this, and we did those on Twiv a while ago, but mm -hmm. it's still not clear because mammals have so many other kinds of defenses. It's not clear right. that you would mm -hmm. need this. But anyway, in worms. There's a dicer uh, enzyme that chops up incoming uh, RNAs dicer. into pieces. It. They're loaded it's in onto the blue apron, doesn't that? <laughs> so they're loaded into a protein called uh, argonaut, which then yeah. uh, will will use that RNA, which is about 22 nucleotide long, and it will find incoming viral RNAs and chop them up, and that's their antiviral defense. And there's there's something very interesting here that I've always wondered about. They're, they're is actually an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in worms and other organisms, insects and plants, that will take these short RNAs and amplify them, wow. make more of them. And they cannot, the interesting thing is, they cannot make copies of viral genomes, these RNA polymerases. So they're bona fide enzymes, but they're limited to just making short. Limited? Enzymes. Did you say limited? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the correct grammar. They're limited to making short. No, no, we, 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 I was referenced to an earlier discussion. It was? We having... Oh, I'm limited. Yeah, Dixon this morning, I walk in and he says, you're limited. I said, no, I didn't you. say Thank that. You. Yeah, you did. That's not how that arose. All right, so that's what's happening. And they want to know, in worms, um, does RNA I play a role in virus defense. The problem is, only recently was a virus discovered that infects C. elegans, and we covered it on TWIV. It's an OV virus, right? Yeah, or say virus. Or say TWIV, virus. Gosh, it was so long ago, TWIV 123. And only in the gut cells, and only in some gut cells. And this was this episode was called Contaminated Prostates, Absolute Truth, and Bleached Worms. <laughs> I wonder who came up with that the, one. Alan. <laughs> Alan Dove. Uh, probably was, me. Um, or say was found in rotting fruit in France, or say virus. Um, yeah, and so, but the problem is that um, it only infects a few intestinal cells, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not lethal. <laughs> oh, lethal. Which is good if you're a worm, but not so good if <laughs> you want to study it. They haven't made fluorescent versions of it, although that seems to me a technical limitation, and it's not vertically transmitted, so they, they don't particularly like yeah. this model. So they, they said, can VSV work in C. elegans? Where we have, uh, we know a lot. Do you have a about feeling for why they asked whether VSV rather than any other kind of virus? Do you know why they picked VSV? 
Because I don't, uh, but so maybe you don't. I don't. Know. I think because it has a relatively broad host range. Mm, it could okay. be. Don't we know that, in mm. fact, that it can infect Drosophila? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And mice. Yeah. It's a good one to try. What is the natural host, in your opinion, Kathy? Cows. Cows. Okay. And it's transmitted by some kind of uh, insect, right? What kind? Do we know the, the nature? It's an arbovirus. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe and cat- cows might not be the definitive host. Yeah. but It might be a funny a name. It might be an interesting name. I'm going to look it up. VSV uh, insect vector. Sand flies are one of the Sand. known vectors. So they, they micro-inject worms with yes. VSV. Right. Um, which has a red... Because you can't red. get sand flies to bite them, or at least the worms wouldn't survive. Let's we were talking about that today, weren't we? <laughs> Why not deliver it via insects? Yeah, well. And I'm, I'm sad about microinjection because, you know, we're spoiled in virology. We just take cells, right. remove the medium, and add virus. And I had, a, I had a postdoc years ago who microinjected some cells. Boy, I mean, you, first you need to find this apparatus, and then you have to learn how to use it. Transfecting and, and worms it's pretty, is very difficult. It's pretty labor-intensive, but... So but can, if you run if you run a worm lab, you're already set up to do that. Yeah, I'm sure you are. You are. I'd they used to shotgun them in, didn't they? I don't know. Yeah, they had a some kind of a device like electroporation, except it was like ballistic tens of thousand. transformation. <laughs> ballistic yeah. transformation. That's right. Exactly. Anyway, right. they can see uh, DS red in animals that were microinjected. So the red is going to be produced by transcription of the genome into mRNA production of proteins and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but doesn't seem to be infecting neurons, which they can identify because they have a green fluorescent protein identifying the neurons. This is a cool thing about worms. You just can look at them and see what the cells are because exactly. they're transparent, right? Exactly right? Those who live in glass houses, those who live in glass worms shouldn't grow viruses or something ooh, like that. Ooh, ooh. I, uh, I just found a paper about VSV mm-hmm. enabling gene transfer and transynaptic tracing in a wide range of organisms. Old and New World monkeys, seahorses, axolotls. Seahorses and axolotls? <laughs> Two invertebrates, Drosophila melanogaster and the box jellyfish, the box Tridalia <laughs> cystophora. Who the hell would ah. work on that? I mean, you could die working on that one. Yeah. yeah. What's an axolotl? It's, it's a, a, it's a, a amphibian, right? Kind of a salamander type of mm. thing. So they, they do find that these VSV will infect muscles, cells. Right. Clear infection of body, wall, Which muscle, and the head and tail. Very specific. I mean, yeah. as a nematodologist, <laughs> I would say that the choices are numerous. How many different cell types are there in a, a nematode? Uh, you have neurons, you have muscle cells. What else? I, I think there are probably over 100 Gut different cells. kinds of cells. Gut and cells, then there's right. a bunch of different kinds of nerve cells. There's no hair cells, though. Epithelia. Epithelia, Epithelia, and then the cuticular, cuticular cells that generate the cuticle, the hypodermal gland cells. You'd have to have uh, various secretory that's right. cells. You um, do. You do. Gametes. I think, that's right. I think we need to do a worm paper every week to engage you. I, I'm in, no, come on now. <laughs> you don't have to nudge me to yeah, wake me up. But you're more, this, engaged, <laughs> you're more engaged than usual. Well, I'm just, anyway, they have different strains of C. elegans, isolates they call them, and, yeah. and I like the one called... Uh, the Hawaiian animals. They call them the Hawaiian animals. <laughs> and they have different infection rates, which suggests that some are more resistant to infection than others, which would be easy to follow up. I don't think they end up doing that in this paper. Yeah. All right, now they start to do some genetics because with C. elegans, they have virtually every gene knocked out, you know. Right. So you can say, right. what, what's the effect of taking genes out? So they have this one gene called DRH1. Uh, DRH1 is very much like Rig I in mammalian cells, which is a helicase that detects uh, viral RNA in the cytosol and triggers antiviral programs. And, of course, Rig I triggers interferon production, and DRH1 in worms helps initiate the antiviral RNAi response. So they take animals lacking DRH1, and they infect them, and they get infection in tissues that they didn't see before which is interesting, so they must be protected by the exactly. RNAi they, response. Another thing you should have said, Vincent, come on, this is about receptors. Come on. What do you mean it's about receptors? There is a, 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 an organism that starts from one cell and differentiates into multiple cells, yeah. and only yeah. the muscle cells are susceptible. So this receptor well, you, is only in muscle cells. No, no. no what it you could just be said an internal block. could be an internal block. So what you said is a little misleading because susceptibility typically means uh, receptor. What we know is that other cells... 
other than muscles are not infected. Could be a problem in susceptibility. It could be a problem in permissivity, which be internal. Hold on, I'm almost done. And there could be a a defensive problem, right? Can't they tell with this fluorescent marker whether it gets in or not? But then it doesn't replicate after. Then it wouldn't. It would. It would have to for to express the marker. It has to get in and have its genes expressed. Yeah, it has to make mRNA and they have to be translated. Well, they they could micro inject it into each of these cells too, because they are really good at that. You could do it for sure, and then you could look for RNAs to see. But it got into yeah. the uh, germ cells. It got into yeah, it does get in the germ cells, you see. But basically, if you take out DRH1, you get more substantial infection. Got you it. get more spread. You get right. um, elevated levels of DSRED and so forth. And they do a variety of different doses and show that the you know the DRH1s are basically, uh, uh, what, what word should I use? More... Permissive? I don't want to use uh, permissive or susceptible. They're more, more infectable. More robust. It looks like DRH1 is clearly involved in defense against micro-injected VSV. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah, high selective pressure for that one, I'm sure. And they never get 100% infection, right? Or maybe in these DR, DRH1 animals they do. Um, in contrast, yeah, in, in uh, DRH1 animals, they get 100% infection rates depending on the dose, but not in... Um, in, Do they uh, say which stage of this worm they're inge- they? injecting? These are adult worms. Are they males or females? It's got to be ma- females, all right, because they were looking at eggs after, after a while. I, I didn't look. Because there are four larval they, stages uh, and an adult stage, I and then know. both male I could look at them. These are all adults, but I'm adult. not sure. It must yeah. be female because they were looking at eggs afterwards. Yeah, young adults. Young adults. <laughs> young adults. The young so they're adults. just out of college. <laughs> That's right. They're partying. They're partying. That's right. They're living with their parents still. <laughs> <laughs> young adults. Uh, and they look at lifespan assays. So they have a uh, yes. LT50. Um, LT50. Lethal time. 50%. So the amount of virus that causes lethal. Uh, the ta- the time at which 50% of them died, have died. Have died. Yes. The time at which. T- oh. That's unusual. We don't usually do that in cell culture. No. Mm-hmm. We just look at death. And so um, when, uh, they have uh, they have they clearly show that infection is lethal. N two animals survive longer than uh, the DRH one animals. So let me give me some. I'll give you some numbers. So, or yeah. Maybe so the, Kathy the, can, yeah. well, I, I have numbers, but it was a little confusing to me halfway through the paper when I. Had forgotten that N2 was their strain name, yeah, and I was yeah. thinking N2 is a genetic term, and they were talking about <laughs> yeah, the second intercross generation. <laughs> so I like to think of it as the wild type versus the DRH1 mutants. Yeah, yeah. But um, at a dose of 10 to the two, yep, yep. there's 220 of the wild type versus 112 of, in the DRH1, and then as you go up in dose, there are fewer, but there's always more. Uh, in the wild type strain than in the yeah. mutant strain. And these are hours post infection. Hours. Right. Yeah. LT50 times. Yeah. Uh, so I was saying more. I should have said longer. Right. These yeah. are long lived organisms with regards to an invertebrate. I mean, these can live about a year and a half or two years. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm. If you feed them properly. And you stick them in the refrigerator, they'll last a long, long time. Just like people. They'll just go to sleep. So these results, they say, suggest that. DRH1 animals lacking this gene involved in the generation of RNA mm-hmm. suffer higher infection rates and reduced survival times. Perfect summary. Right. 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 And they sequenced uh, these animals to look at the RNA, the small RNAs that are produced. They do deep sequencing in infected and uninfected animals. And then they can take the sequences of the small RNAs and map them to the viral right. genome. Cool. That was very Figure cool. with that. And you can see that you have a representation Across the genome, there's a peak length of 22 nucleotides with a preference for a G at the 5 prime N, which is a known type of small interfering uh, RNA, which is generated in worms. So would you call this an acquired immune response? It's considered um, intrinsic, <laughs> which means yeah, it's always it's inducible. It's an inducible well, response. Well, it, it responds to infection, yes. Right, and it, it, hype, and it amplifies. The RNA is amplified, yeah. Right, there's, there's a level of specificity to its mechanism, right? Because mm-hmm. it sure. it dices up the RNA and then right. recognizes that specific RNA. Sure, correct, correct. Um, but it's a it's a generic mechanism in the sense that it recognizes all kinds of things that look like viral RNA and dices them up and initiates this response. Right. right. Now, if they if they sequence the RNAs from DRH 
one animals. They see fewer small RNAs and uh, a difference in the strand to which they are directed. So they think these animals are impaired, which you would expect because this is a it gene would. involved in the initiation of the so AI response. Yeah, variants in VSV. Yeah virus to put in at the same time to see what the population of dicer-like molecules would be would be very interesting, don't you think? Yeah, it would be interesting um, to put, yes, I'm sure they're planning to do that because they've just established, this is basically establishing a system here. Right. Then they make a luciferase assay for VSV replication. I like that too. Which Dixon liked. I did. I like it very much. You don't have to kill the worms, right? That's right. You can just Just, uh, You can watch them turn on fire. (laughs) They put a a luciferase gene into VSV, and then you can do Mm. chemiluminescent. And basically, they made fireflies out of worms. Exactly. Exactly right. (laughs) Wouldn't wouldn't that be amazing if you went outside at night and saw (laughs) glowing sea elegans in the soil? There is a worm that lives in New Zealand in caves that is a fluorescent worm. Oh, yeah? So, yeah, they've got that already. I bet they could sell pet sea elegans that glow. Because <laughs> they, they sell pet fish, right? Yes. Pet sea elegans. Yeah, why not? I would buy those. And I'd put them in a terrarium. And, oh, you could, or you could make fluorescent ants, too. You could do that. So this way, and notice up to this point, though, we don't, we don't, we don't have any plaque assays. So here they say, to further characterize infection, we created a simple quantitative assay to assess replication. I'm thinking... Well, we already have one. It's called a plaque assay. <laughs> yeah, but you have to, you have to kill the worms. I know you have cells. to kill the worms, you yes. Do. But they don't do a plaque assay in any of this paper, however, no, no, no. which I, I'm sad about, I must say. I mean, I well, bet, it's, it's a worm lab. They don't have your <laughs> same appreciation of... Yeah, maybe that. Anyway, so they say that um, the, the luciferase uh, measurement mirrors virus production, and they give a reference for that. Right. So they microinject with the different um, the different worms with the VSV luciferase, and you get much higher signal and light out of the wild-type worms compared to the uh, DRH1 worms, mm-hmm. as you might expect. Mm-hmm. And they can do kinetics. Um, Wait, I, these, did you say that right? What? 600-fold higher. Uh, yes. Light units from infected N2 animals were 600-fold higher than from mock. Sorry, mock. Right. In contrast, the signals from the mutant are 8,000-fold higher. <laughs> yes, you're right. right. Thank you. I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> right. 8,800. Dixon, would, he doesn't listen, so he would I'm listening, but I don't have the paper up in front. I'm sorry. So 8,800-fold oh. higher. Yeah, that doesn't make sense the way I said it. Right. You take away DRH1, and it replicates like gangbusters. Yeah. Yeah. There you so go. that's a cool assay, and that's all they do with it, and so presumably we'll be seeing more from that. Now, they do another experiment which shows if you put um, – the worms in the refrigerator right? Um, at 25. It slows down, right? You get, yeah, it slows down. You get less um, uh, mortality. You get less light signals, actually, mm-hmm. at 25 compared to uh, 15, which is not surprising because everything's slowing down at the lower temperature, right? Exactly. Right. So um, I didn't find that I think remarkable. you said that wrong, too, but. Uh, get- light <laughs> signals were uh, higher when either. Yeah. Animals were cultured at 25 versus 15, yeah. Except right. It's actually intuitive because right. more metabolism at the higher lower temperature, the temperature, more infection. The lower the rate of metabolism. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't expect that, that. I would expect that. For every 10 degrees, you mm-hmm. get a doubling of biochemical reaction. And right? the LT50 values, Lawrence Taylor, 50%. Lawrence Taylor. They, right. they decrease with increasing temperature, so more le- they die quicker yeah. at mm-hmm. higher temperatures. Yeah. Um, which is not not surprising. I don't know why that's in there at all. I don't know if it has anything to do with RNAi. Um, then they have a bunch of other genes that they have knocked out, which are downstream in the uh, RNAi pathway. Uh, they have one called uh, R- RDE1, <laughs> and uh, they have they have mice. I was going to say they have worms lacking RDE1, and they also have higher luciferase production. So these these are downstream of uh, the the previous gene we're talking about here. I, I don't know exactly what these are doing, so I can't tell you. Uh, they have a, a gene called SID1, SID1, which is required Maybe for... Dr. Sidney Brenner, probably. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> systemic, required for systemic spread of exogenous RNAi signals. They have genes encoding the argonauts, and uh, they, have, they do not have uh, altered luciferase susceptibilities. Interestingly. So these other genes are not involved in the RNAi pathway. Right. Uh, let's see. Um, they have, now, 
RDE1, back to RDE1, which was another gene um, involved in uh, down, involved in RNAi pathway components. Uh, all the DRH and RDE1 animals were red by 48 hours. Um, the LT50 were lower than N2 animals. I think I got that right, <laughs> right? Because it takes shorter, are effects checker. <laughs> takes shorter time to uh, kill them. So path, uh, RNA by pathway components downstream of DRH1 are, are mm-hmm. needed for an antiviral effect. Now, Dixon, we get to vertical transmission. We do. Why are they so interested in vertical transmission? Well, then that way they can raise up a bunch of worms with this without having to re-inject them. What, not if it kills them, though, right? Well, it? well, let's see what happens. All right, so they noticed that they, they use this growth medium for worms that has a DNA synthesis inhibitor, and they would get fluorescent embryos from infected mothers, but only when this DNA synthesis inhibitor was, was present. Is this a chemically defined medium? Uh, yeah, it's nematode growth medium. Because they used to raise them on lawns of killed bacteria. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they still do. I see. So they've advanced. It says, during our lifespan assays. Oh, okay. Maybe you don't want to give them bacteria then. Oh. We noticed that when we use nematode growth medium with the DNA synthesis inhibitor, we used to, we got red embryos. Interesting. All right? Yep. And so they, they said, oh, maybe can be vertically transmitted. Right. Um. But right. I ne- had to keep reminding myself that the red <laughs> meant virus. Red, you know, yes, they just yes, kept right, talking yes, about yes, red, and if right, they had just said right. VSE red or something, it right. would have helped me a little. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they right, keep right, saying right. DS red, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, they didn't find vertical transmission without this DNA synthesis inhibitor. Hmm. And so they wanted to know uh, what's going on here. Uh, and it, in fact, the, the, this DNA synthesis inhibitor causes vertical transmission. But they also found that um, if they use DH, DRH1 animals, then they see vertical transmission. So it doesn't happen in the wild type animals unless you put the DNA synthesis inhibitor in there. But without the DNA synthesis inhibitor, I'm sorry, with the DNA synthesis inhibitor in DRH1 animals, they get vertical transmission. Yeah, it's DR, this is in DRH1 animals. Then uh, they. Try direct germline injection. So, Dixon, right. you can you can find the germ cells in the no in the problem. worm. No. Really, no problem. No problem. They have labels. Huh? They do, <laughs> and you can inject VSV directly into those, and then of course they see germline right. transmission. Right. All right. So basically, if you and you don't need FUDR, the DNA synthesis inhibitor for that, you can just inject into germ cells. It ends up in the embryos. But if you inject into somatic cells then you have to have a DNA synthesis inhibitor and you have to knock out the yep. DRH1 because right. apparently you get better replication so it makes its way into embryos. Right. So these were right. females that they were doing this with, right? As far as I know, those are the ones that okay. have embryos, yes. No, I no, could no. be wrong. No, no, but they could have injected this into <laughs> males and seen whether the sperm got infected and then whether Aren't that there? was transferred. Also. Right, now there are also yeah. hermaphrodite worms, right? Uh, these are not hermaphrodites. These are not hermaphrodites. They were, okay, they were doing females. They yeah. have males and females. In. No, but so, the, fe- the embryos develop in the female, of right? Of course, of course. That's what I was joking about. Actually, the embryos develop outside in the egg. <laughs> so yeah. well, the female the lays egg. Don't. When is it fertilized? Outside? No, it's inside the female, and then they oh, so lay the eggs. So these are sexual reproduction. They, that's right. They mate? Yep. Okay. Then you have fertilization, then exactly. eggs are laid, and then they develop into embryos. So, That's correct. Yeah, they saw the, the virus in the embryos outside of the worm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. right, which makes this an easy organism to handle in the lab. All right, so basically you can inject right into the germ cells and get vertical transmission, or you can inject in somatic cells in a DRH1 mutant and have this DNA synthesis inhibitor present, and then you'll get vertical transmission. Right. Um, the last thing they do is look at inheritance of immunity after infection. Inheritance of immunity. Isn't that interesting? Transgenerational immunity. Sounds Lamarckian to me. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, come on. Sure. You know, the, the parent acquires some trait and passes it on to the offspring. Yeah, like longer mm-hmm. necks because the trees are taller. And right. That one – doesn't work, but no. the, there, there are other examples. <laughs> I, you know, that's funny things. because they, that's exactly what epigenetics is about, isn't it? Yes. They make <laughs> the point that um, there's evidence for transgenerational inheritance of RNAi um, generated by the production of foreign transgene or uh, vir- other virus replication right. in C. elegans. 
So they wanted to see if this would work in their model. So they take embryos from animals, either mock or VSV infected. They allow the progeny to develop and then challenge them right. with DS red VSV. So animals whose mother had been exposed previously, born to mothers who had a lower infection rate. How about that? So they were somewhat, somewat right? protected. That's right. Um, and um, they noticed the wild type and DRH1 progeny had different infection rates, yep. right? Because yep. the DRH1 has got a problem in generating uh, RNAi. Exactly. Yeah, so getting back to uh, just to touch on something Dixon said earlier, yep. Yep. Um, this this is acquired immunity. Yeah. It's, it's a somewhat durable acquired immunity in that once exposed, they retain it. Yeah. And, as we see here, pass it on to their offspring. There's memory. <sighs> Wait a minute now. Memory. Go on. Memory. Now, if you had a worm that survived, yeah. and then a year later you challenged it, it would just remake the small RNAs. There doesn't have to be any memory. Now, if you're passing it on to I'll offspring, them. that's something different. That's what I meant. I mean, then there has to be memory. That's what I meant. It's a, maybe there's just some RNA, small RNAs remaining for a while, and then those get passed on to the Which offspring. would constitute a form of memory. Uh, Correct. No, a form of memory would be... All right, it's a form of memory. Fine. I'm yeah. thinking of the well, adaptive kind of it's not, it's, Yeah, by analogy, it's not, a, it's not a, a, an adaptive immune system. Uh, the you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's, not, an, it's adaptive immunity, Captain, but not as we know it. Exactly. You know, because adaptive immunity, we say, is tailored to the pathogen, right? Yeah. And this is right. tailored in a way because you're using the genome from the pathogen right. to, to, to stay. So all our terminology basically is bogus. In the end. <laughs> well, it depends on the system. system. So anyway, in uh, just don't have Jane. Right about this. You know, that's partially why I'm confused because we have these terms in the textbook. We have intrinsic, innate, and yeah, adaptive immunity. Intrinsic is always present, and we include RNAi, apobex, things mm -hmm. like that. Innate is induced rapidly, but there's no memory, and adaptive is tailored to the pathogen, and it has memory. It, yeah. okay, you so, see, this is this is what biology does to you when you try to impose structures. <laughs> yeah, on I understand, it. but it helps. <laughs> you know, it's I mean, like this is a species, and that's a different species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. that's right. Look, it does help to teach because you can say, okay, it this is, is what this, it is. This is critically important when you're writing a textbook. But yes. <laughs> students will often say, "Where does this fit in?" And that's great yeah. because yes. then I say, "We don't know." And look, in the end, all this is human classification. That's true. You know, it's not, nature doesn't have these rules that we impose, but we try to impose some order to make studying it and yep. writing about it more. And so what we're going through now about this is, uh, is an example of, mm -hmm. of the problems. Yeah, the particle physicists are at about the same place. <laughs> all right, so they, the last experiment they do with this uh, memory, they have animals lacking or with a change in this gene called RDE3, this gene encodes a nucleotidal transferase that's needed for the production of these 22 nucleotide, nucleotide SI right. RNAs. Right. Um, these, these animals are hypersusceptible to infection, and uh, progeny derived from mothers with this mutation um, are, they don't have, they're not protected no. any longer. No. Remember that wild type animals, the offspring are protected when the mother is challenged, and that you, you challenge the offspring here. And this animals derived from RDE three null uh, mothers are not protected. So that means that right. this um, enzyme that's important for biogenesis of the twenty two G mm -hmm. is needed to have this uh, memory effect. Right. What do you think this memory effect is? You think it's residual uh, SIs, small RNAs that are passed on? I would think so. Mm. That's the simplest explanation. Yeah. So the idea would be, if there's a half life for these small RNAs, that's another. Question. A long time. The longer time you wait, the less. What's the um, gestation period for a, a C. elegans, Dixon? Do you know? I mean, once they're fertilized, how long does it yeah. take to lay yeah. eggs? Days. Okay, and then the lifespan could be years. You said a year and a half, two years, and there's a special mm -hmm. knockout, Xenorhabditis, that extends the life by making it into a dower larva. Remember, there's a yeah, yeah, gene right. for this. <laughs> yeah, it's called Dower, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay, so an interesting experiment would be to say how long this yeah. immunity lasts. Yeah, that's And if right. it's gone after a year, then maybe right. it's just from small RNA sticking around. Yeah. All right, so that's that's it. They have a model now for uh, looking at the role of RNA interference in virus infection in worms. You have to micro-inject, but that's okay. 
they have some evidence that there is an RNAi response that it's passed vertically the virus can be passed vertically and that the RNAi response can be passed to offspring right and remember the offspring are better protected <laughs> than if they're from mothers that were never infected so it's not just that they're making an RNAi response oh, okay. but they're making a better one apparently okay now figure that one out i right? can't hmm. i'll have to work with these guys <laughs> Didn't they also mention another species of Cenorhoditis, Cenorhoditis burgzii? Yeah, they had a couple of species they tried <laughs> they initially. Did. They, did. they ended up using the N2, right? And uh, why was that? Is that because it's more susceptible? Let me look back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, the other one was Br- C. briggsi, Cenorhoditis right. briggsii. Yeah. And only 20% of animals uh, got infected, so they, exactly. they just used the N2 that's right. Isolate. By the way, and, and memory <laughs> um, serves me well on this issue of if you want to find out what the biology of Cenorhabditis elegans is all about, there's a wonderful film that was made back in the late 60s, early 70s by a guy by the name of Carrie Lou. Yeah. And the, yeah, name, yeah. Of it, the name of the film was Nematode. Oh, that's and it's cool. a fantastic mm. film. I mean, it's really <laughs> quite beautifully made and uh, simple and direct, and it shows all the behaviors of. Uh, Normal mm-hmm. and mutant um, Cenorhabditis elegans. Hmm. So, Dixon, I have to tell you a story, very brief. Right, my wife when she first went to Merck, yes, she was assigned to work on ivermectin. Because- no, wait, 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 Kathy and, and uh, Alan, don't listen to this. It's just for no, me. no, it's not for Kathy. And- <laughs> I'm sorry, you're right. It's a, it's a parasite story, but Kathy and, and Alan will hear it. She was assigned to work on ivermectin, which right. is it kills worms, right? It does. Right. And they said, why don't you use C. elegans to identify the receptor? Right. And so she did. She had. She came here into New York to Marty Chalfie's lab for Fantastic. a few weeks and learned how to Great lab. manipulate C. elegans and so forth. And then she went back and yep. used it because yep. it will kill them. And so I forgot the, the uh, how she did it, but she ended up identifying yep. the receptor. As so this morning I was reading this paper and I... Yeah. I said, you know anything about C. elegans? And I can't repeat her response on this show. <laughs> right. So there is no memory then when it comes to... <laughs> so the authors of this paper say they were surprised by the inheritance of an antiviral response, and this is going to be a fascinating adaptation that warrants okay. further investigation. Okay. Yes. So they're excited about this. I thought it was an, an unusual, and, yeah. and I knew you would yeah. like it, and I knew yeah. Kathy would no, like my it. Early yeah, days what I... Go ahead, Kathy. No, you go ahead. Your early days. My early days at Rockefeller as a postdoc was in the lab of uh, George Jackson, and he was uh, culturing about five different species of soil nematodes and uh, working out the defined diets for them. It was chemically defined diets. And uh, he had Neoaplectanic glauseri, named after Glauser, and there's a building mm-hmm. on the campus named Glauser Hall, and that was uh, named after that gentleman. Uh, Cenorhabditis elegans, of course, was a, a, another one, Briggsy. And uh, I forget, there were a couple of others that I'm blocking on, but it was fascinating to see all these worms uh, all in one place, different flasks growing like crazy, you know, setting the uh, table, so to speak, Mm -hmm. or the work that was to follow. What I found interesting was the connection to defective interfering particles of VSV. Mm -hmm. Um, And so (laughs) uh, it's been postulated that interfering particles may serve as an RNA decoy, allowing VSV evasion of the RNAi machinery. And so they're interested in looking at whether VSV produces DI particles in C. elegans and whether the small RNAs targeting them are loaded into the RDE1, et cetera, complex. So I, the question that I should have asked, which I didn't, and I should have known this because I read that paper twice, but I didn't see the data, was that if the offspring of permissive worms that have the VSV virus in them, and they go on to develop all of the cells, are the virus particles still only found in muscle cells and in germline cells? Mm. Hmm. Don't know. Because <clears throat> it has the option for going yeah. into all of them then at that point, doesn't it? No, it's an interesting so what, is, what does congenital VSV look like? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's a good question. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There might be some effects, right? Maybe. So here's the paper. Cloning of an Avermectin-sensitive glutamate-gated chloride channel from C. elegans. Look at that. And your wife's name is on that paper, First right? author, uh, and also on this paper, is uh, Lex Vander- Vassilatis, who you know, yeah, and Lex Vander- Vander- Sure, sure. Nature, 1994. Good people. 
the year of uh, Aiden's birth. How about that? Huh. Okay, uh, that's that. <laughs> and we will now do a few emails. Great. First one is, oh, the first two are actually an arc. <laughs> and, and you may remember a few weeks ago we had a letter from Mary M., who uh, lives in Iran, and uh, we um, asked her what it was like. So she wrote back, and then another person wrote in as well. And Miriam writes, Dear Vincent and all the lovely TWIV team. <laughs> Thank it's, you so much. <laughs> it's it's me again, your Iranian TWIV addict. <laughs> the weather here in Gorgon is 11 Celsius and mostly cloudy. When I heard your reply, I couldn't stop smiling. It made me so happy. <laughs> Don't think I'm crazy, but I was walking in the house with a smile on my face. I wanted to wake ev- up everyone and tell them about it, but I couldn't because they were my guests and I wanted to be polite. Thank <laughs> you so much. You asked me to tell you about Iran. You're right. There are so many great people here. For example, I think my mother is the kindest person I've ever seen. Hmm. I'm sorry that you hear only the bad things, but the truth is Iran is a beautiful country full of great people and great cultures. Every city here has its own unique culture. I think what you hear the most is about our government, which, to be honest, nobody likes them here as well. And that's actually the first reason I want to leave this beautiful country. (laughs) I envy you having the freedom to talk about everything you want. I mean, we can't talk about politics here because it's too dangerous. We have to be careful all the time. Actually, here on TWIV, we can't either. It's dangerous for us to talk about. Should have used a pseudonym for her then. What's that? She'll use the pseudonym for her so this doesn't get back to anybody in her own. She seems not well, to she's, mind. Yeah, she's not okay. talking much about politics. All right, she all right, said right. you can't talk about it. Oh, right? okay. You asked me what it's like to be a student here. It's a little complicated. We have a barrier called Concur, Iranian University Entrance Exam. Taking this exam is the only way someone can go to the university at any level of education. So I think, no, we can't study whatever we want because of this Concur thing. It's worked out well for me, though. I mean, maybe in my first university or my first major microbiology, I was accepted by chance, because believe me, I didn't know a thing about it. But for my master's conquer, it was different. It's more specific. I mean, I decided to study virology myself. Mm -hmm. Virology exam is in combination with bacteriology, parasitology, and mycology. The only way to study virology is to take that exam, and there are only eight universities that have the virology program. I'm glad that I've accepted to the field I love. In our master's MSc program, we learn how to be a researcher in the field of medical virology. First three semesters, we have some virology courses, virology lab training programs, seminars, lab meetings, etc., but it's not satisfying me enough, so I'm watching online courses, and I ask the lab manager to help her in the lab. I'm trying to learn as much as I can. While we take our classes, we have to write our proposal and defend it. If our proposal is approved, then we can work on it and do our experimentations and stuff. After we're done, we have to write our thesis, and then we're going to defend it. That's it. Right now, I'm searching in all the databases, reading articles to find my subject. Actually, it's too hard for me to come up with an idea. The only thing I know is that I want to work on polio and cancer. I'm very confused these days, and I don't have an advisor, professor, to help me yet. P.S. Both my universities were out of my hometown. My hometown is Tehran. It's too far from where I am now. PPS, I learned English myself. That's why I thought I had problems. I think I learned it mostly from movies and radio. <laughs> Glad that I'm fine. Thank you for everything. Love you all, Mariam. Nice. Cool. 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 Well, nice. Mm-hmm. Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Asal writes, Hi, TWIV team. As I was listening to TWIV 430, I was excited to hear Mariam's email from Iran and decided to reveal my nationality since you all seem to be curious about how education would be in the Persian land. I'm an Iranian female, a longtime TWIV listener, and a Patreon supporter. I've written to TWIV a couple times before. My husband and I had the pleasure to meet Vincent, Kathy, and Rich at ASV 2016. (laughs) I'm also looking forward to meeting Alan and Dixon someday. I live in Texas now. Iranians are pretty much science enthusiasts and math lovers. During my undergraduate studies in Iran, I had the chance to sit in virology classes taught by some great Iranian virologists, Dr. Nateg, and Dr. Mokhtari Azad, both of whom are females. Dr. Mokhtari Azad also led the polio eradication program in Iran. Hmm. As a female scientist, you barely feel suppressed at any levels of education in Iran. It is not rare to be a female leader in Iran either. After finishing my undergraduate degree in microbiology and molecular biology in Tehran and before I came to the U.S., I worked in a molecular diagnostics lab specialized for clinical virology. 
I had realized out of all microbes, there was some strong affinity for viruses in me. Tehran was where I learned many of the molecular skills in this area. In the U.S., Texas, I finished my graduate studies in clinical lab sciences with emphasis in molecular diagnostics while working as a supervisor of the molecular ID department in a reference lab. Just recently, I have assumed the same role in a pediatrics hospital lab. I sometimes teach molecular diagnostics of clinical viruses to graduate students in the field. I usually tend to be laconic in my writing, but since you were wondering, Vincent, <laughs> I wanted to be thorough. It's never enough to say how informative your show is. Thanks to all you wonderful hosts. Well, that's great. Thank you, both of you. Anyone yes. else out there is living somewhere where we don't know about, tell us Tell us all about it. Exactly. Yeah. We won't get in trouble. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Julie writes, Dear Twiv, I've been a faithful listener for several years now, and I could elaborate extensively on the value of this podcast and all the Twix podcasts. Now more than ever, we need, we need solid scientific education and dialogue. I genuinely appreciate all you do, and I cheered out loud alone in my car while <laughs> listening to Vincent's rant last week. <laughs> and at this point, all of us became confused in the letter because Kathy comments, which week, which rant. Dixon had the same. I had the same confusion. <laughs> Um, Who exactly. Knows? There's one every week. Yes. No? There's, one there's, every a, there's a weekly rant. That's right. Sorry. Um, I'll stop. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> Julie, no, please. It's <laughs> part of what people listen for. Right away. Sure. And Julie liked it. Yeah. She continues. I do hope I'm the 27th emailer, as the 23rd <laughs> was my birthday, and I love books. It'd be cool to say I got a birthday mm. present from Twiv, <laughs> though I think the podcast itself is quite a lovely gift as it is. Mm. Thanks again for doing such important work. If I ever win the lottery, Twix is at the top of my donate to nice. list. Nice. Signing off from rainy, dreary, six degrees C, North <laughs> Alabama. That's very nice. Yes. Well, uh, this email came on February 2nd. The previous TWIV was number 426, and my two picks were articles about Trump's science advisor <laughs> being a climate denialist and his anti-vax committee and the National Park Service not being silenced. So I suspect that was what my rant was about that right. probably got the other people started on no uh, we, we would know. have ranted with you if we had known yes. <laughs> all right dixon uh jared writes hello vincent et al i'm writing to secure a copy of emerging infections and also to echo sentiments that have been aired on twiv about the creepiness of prions <laughs> it wigs me out to think that something as simple as a misfolded protein could cause death in a complex vertebrate organism Tonight, the weather in Austin is cloudy, 11 degrees C, and it is certainly nothing to write home about. Loving the Prions papers, nothing like a good mystery to keep the mind engaged. The best, Jared H. from Austin, Texas. Cloudy, 11 C, wow. Rich, Rich should get in touch Rich with Rich is always person. telling us how hot it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next one's from Kim. Hello, this is, take this as my entry into the book contest, but I actually have a topic I'd like you to discuss. Mm -hmm. You, and specifically Vincent, has, has frequently criticized the luxury journals, <laughs> such as Nature Science Cell, and I completely agree with all the criticism, and Twiv 426, which, by the way, has, once again, a hilarious title. <laughs> Vincent spoke about the Cell Report's paper and its layout as, not, as being not good or bad. I completely agree with everything said in the episode regarding the small figure legends and a lot of figures in the supplementary I myself actively avoid reading papers from these really compressed journals, and it is so tough to read such papers. I prefer formats where the authors are given more space to write and explain, which makes the papers so much more comfortable to read. Mm -hmm. By the way, <coughs> taking a, a moment here, it reminds me, in the previous paper, there are some parts of the manuscript where there are three lines on the bottom of a page because they squeezed the figure in. I w yes. If I were writing a grant, I would never leave three lines, yeah. right? Either none or more. Yeah, and the and the first figure comes up before <laughs> it's even discussed, and it turns out that because I printed in black and white, then I made a figure in color for that one that I was able to oppose that figure with the text where it was actually discussed, mm, making cool. it much more convenient. Cool. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that they could mm. do a little more thoughtfulness with the page layout, as many other things as well. Anyway, continuing with Kim. However, in Vincent's recent Zika Diary post, a Zika paper, he explains once again why he doesn't support these luxury journals, <laughs> but also highlights the dilemma he's in with knowing that the best way to further the careers of people working in his lab is to try to publish in the highest impact journal as possible. Vincent ends the post with, quote, My lab wants to publish their Zika virus paper in a high impact journal, and I can't deny them that wish. 
My job is to nurture their careers, not jeopardize them because I think that these journals are damaging science, end quote. Mm-hmm. My question to you as a group is, whose responsibility is it to take this fight against this broken system of publishing and impact factor nonsense? The Zika Diary post really made me depressed. Vincent, as one of the greatest advocates of bioarchive, open access, non-luxury journals, is now not putting his money where his mouth is. I completely and 100% understand the dilemma written in a Zika paper post and understand Vincent's decision not to jeopardize their careers. But at the same time, isn't this action a bit hypocritical? I'd love for you to have a discussion on this for Vincent to maybe expand on his thinking, although I already completely understand his stance. All right, then he has pick of the week here, which I will save for later. Mm-hmm. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Exactly. Well, uh, the American Society for Microbiology has decided, well, I guess it was over a, almost a year ago now, July 11, 2016, that they're not supporting impact factors for its journals. So they're not going to advertise impact factors. Uh, it is hoped that this will... I'll allow a move away from the system and its undue focus on journal impact factors. Well, I think you can blame the guy who established current contents for all of this. He just died. Yeah. Did Eugene Garfield? Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, they used to publish how many times your article is quoted in which journals and it gave it a score. Well, okay. <laughs> so that's somebody, somebody published that, but then everybody else had to agree that that was somehow a useful yeah, measure. They, they did their work yeah, for them. No, it's us. We did it. We, I mean, but, no, we did. Uh, but of course if, we if did. tenure review committees looked at that and Me, said, right. oh, this is just silly. You can't put a number on scientific progress. We're not going to evaluate that. We would not be having this discussion. Right. It is, it is a problem because it has been made so by all of us. And I include myself in that. Um, you know, as a when I was in the lab as a scientist, and uh, I cared about what journals sure. my papers were going to be in, and as a science journalist, um, you know, I try to keep up with what's going on all over the place. But I do use as a filtering mechanism subconsciously. Hey, this is a Nature paper. It's probably more interesting than something that appeared in journal I've never heard of. That's true. We had a faculty meeting yesterday. <coughs> Excuse me considering some people for tenure and the discussion goes well if this person publishes this nature paper that should be a shoe in and someone said are we really going to let one nature paper decide tenure <laughs> exactly oh my gosh and the thing is um right here, so i did publish a subsequent post at zika diaries and where i said look i don't know how to solve the problem but asm is trying something which i think is useful. They're having this new initiative at Msphere, where um, I forgot what it's called, but you can get the reviews of your paper. You solicit reviews and you send them into the journal, and they'll just look at them and decide whether to publish or not based on the reviews. So it gets around the problem of them saying we're not going to review this paper, right? Because you have it reviewed, and uh, you can pick the reviewers, so you know presumably who's in the field, and you can get through. So there's no criticizing the editorial board of not putting your paper paper forward. Now, I don't know if this is going to catch on. They seem to think that all the big journals are going to follow suit and do this. I'm, I'm a little skeptical about that, but that would be one way of trying to break uh, this, this monopoly. You could say, Nature, if they take my reviews that I send in, then you don't have this issue about, oh, we're only publishing high-impact stuff or not. Um, but I, I know it's hypocritical for me to do this. If it were up to me only, I would put it on BioArchive and I would send it to a society journal because I think, mm. uh, you know, or a PLOS journal, right? Open access right. Mm-hmm. where you get reviews and it's not just what's the impact factor deciding whether your paper gets reviewed or not. But it's not up to me. It's I have a person in my lab, two people who want to have careers, they want to publish and, and get jobs. So we're this is going to be a while before we can solve this problem. And as someone said here, Alan... What's the answer? Yes, that's the uh, f- future Senator Michael Eisen will take care of that for you. You can write to his office <laughs> uh, after he's Yeah, one elected. of the founders of PLOS. He yes, is running he's for running, senator. Running for Senate uh, wants <laughs> Diane Feinstein's seat in oh, California. Oh, nice. Um, and Feinstein has not been uh, has not been as clear as a lot of people would like in her positions on some of the recent uh, presidential actions. And um, 
uh, eyes, and and uh, he's not alone in seeing that this makes her vulnerable to possibly, um, you know, another Democrat coming on the ticket and unseating her. And Michael Eisen, uh, who has has no shortage of confidence, um, has decided <laughs> that he's going to run for Senate. I don't know how serious that's going to be, but mm. uh, but this is this is the kind of problem that all of us, regardless of what field we're in, will probably confront at some point in our lives. Um, you know, just reading this letter, I was I was thinking that uh, I, I live right outside Springfield, Massachusetts, and Springfield is a um, uh, traditionally an industrial center, it's been an industrial center for 250 years. Um, the industry left in the 70s, as happened all over America. The mills shut down, the place has become depressed. But of course, there's all this, uh, there are these wonderful old houses, and this there's this great architecture, and there's, uh, it'd be a lovely place to live, except that the schools suck because they've lost their whole tax break so it base so it's you know it's the typical problem of uh, of a rust belt city right here in New England um, I live in a town right outside Springfield called Longmeadow uh, the one of the reasons probably the biggest reason that we didn't buy one of those lovely houses in Springfield because they're they're beautiful and they're cheap in many cases. Um, we didn't want to live there because we're raising a kid and we want our kid to go to good schools. And so we're living in the suburb outside the city and therefore not paying into the tax base of the city, which would help fix the problem of the schools in the city. Um, and this general phenomenon has been duplicated by millions of people all across America and it's not going to fix the underlying issue because we all have to make our own decisions on our own lives that may not agree with our overall political mm -hmm. view of what should be done. Yeah. And I think the open access problem is very similar to that. You've got, you've got kids in your lab. Yeah, they're adults, but you've, you've got these, these students who you're raising um, and you want them to get the best start that they can. You want them to get the good publication that you know will be weighed uh, in their in their career decisions, and so you have to set aside your beliefs about the problems in the system and uh, and do what's best for the individuals in your lab. Yeah, for sure. I can't say no. I'm not submitting it to Cell Science Nature because I don't like those journals. Right, because you don't have do anything. At, you don't have anything at. Uh, I mean, no, it's not going to no. hurt you. No, it's not going <laughs> to hurt. Make it's not going to make or break. So if you submit a journal article to like say sell and it's accepted but now you don't have any money to pay for it what happens then <laughs> i don't know if you're lucky your department will pay for it but not this one no. Although, i think sometimes journals will actually have a waiver system for that i would go to my chairman and say look i have this paper and accepted in cell science nature i could get a grant with it right can you pay for it i can't afford it could and i bet it. my chair would pay for it <laughs> You know, I, well, but Kathy's right. You can, yeah, it would be short-sighted of the chair not to because they can, if the grant is coming in, it's going to make up for whatever the paper costs. Yeah. I'm pretty sure for the ASM journals, you can yeah, ASM, ask you can for relief from the journal yeah, itself. Yeah, you can apply for a scholarship. I would agree the there, news. but uh, some of these other journals maybe no. I have. I am an um, editor of MBio, but also any member of the um, – American Academy for Microbiology can get one free paper a year at MBio. Mm -hmm. So I would love to send it to MBio, but it's not one of the choices. <laughs> well, they, they also have a similar submission system for Academy members as to what you just described, where you can mm -hmm. get your own reviews and then submit the paper. For MSphere, that's called MSphere Direct. Yeah. So and you, I picked that in, uh, oh, now I lost yeah. it. TWIV 424, I think, is where I picked it. Yeah. Um, people on the outside might call that a buddy system, though. But it's not if you if you get. In fact, I had uh, somebody tell me that she'd send something, and the reviews were <laughs> solid and and made really good points, and she felt very compelled to answer all of them and address them with experiments and so forth because she knew who they were. And so, uh, you know, the what you might assume isn't necessarily the case. Right. Uh, the first um, M-Sphere direct paper to be accepted was 
a paper from Pat Schloss, who's at the University of Michigan, a colleague of Kathy. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm saying this is because he will be a guest on TWIM in two weeks to talk about this experience and see cool. what it was like and what I did it and so forth. So stay tuned for that. All right. So um, Kim ends up the uh, email. Best regards from a snowless, crappy winter in Stockholm where it is zero <laughs> Celsius. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought Stockholm was nice. It is. Yeah. When it's snowless and cold, I guess not. No, I think yeah. it's nice even then. Alan, did, were you talking about Springfield just now? I was. Sounds like a good place to open a podcasting studio. <laughs> it would be a great place to open a podcasting studio. Yeah. And, it and, and, and it wouldn't and be I, far from you, right? Well, and I talked about the, the Rust Belt aspect of it, just to, to, so people don't get the wrong idea. The place is not a hole. It's actually got a lot going for it, yeah, and no, no. The downtown is really um, when you got the Basketball Hall of Fame. They've yeah. got the Basketball <laughs> Hall of Fame. They've got... Um, the downtown has been bouncing back. We've got a subscription to the symphony orchestra, which we've been absolutely blown away by the fact that there's this world-class symphony right here. And uh, so it does have a lot going for it, but the schools are going to be the last thing to come back. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what creates our dilemma. I want a downtown studio with a glass front. Studio. In Springfield. Yeah. That'd be great. Live from how Western far, Massachusetts. How, how far are you from Springfield, Alan? <laughs> oh, like 10 minutes. Good. Oh, so you would definitely parents. pop in and do a live. Oh, sure. Right. Oh, so I got yeah. to come visit Springfield. Check it yeah. out. But the only <laughs> problem is the snow. I've been up there. Well, yeah, we get snow. <laughs> you could buy a level. <laughs> I would live. <laughs> I, I would live in downtown Springfield. You know, I have a. I'd live in a fifty-seven right. story vertical farm. Right, right there over the Greyhound bus station. Well, no, yeah, but, <laughs> no. Actually, they just they just renovated the Amtrak station back to its. Pennsylvania Railroad glory. Right. So that would be pretty cool. All right, let's do some picks. Alan, what do you have for us? I have something that I wish I didn't need to bring up, but um, here we are. So uh, my, um, my representative in Congress is Richard Neal. My senators, I'm proud to say, are Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey. If you are not capable of stating a similar sentence, either because you don't know who represents <laughs> you in Washington or because you don't like the way they're representing you in Washington, you can visit and should visit these two links that I've put um, in the show notes. This is contact information for your senators and your representatives. And uh, in light of what Vincent is going to pick as his pick, I will point out that the House of Representatives controls the federal budget. They are now a very high priority to talk to in light of what has been proposed as the upcoming federal budget. The senators control, uh, well, the Senate and, and the House control a lot of things together. Uh, the Senate is who you need to talk to about things like uh, confirmations of appointments. Um, as I say, I'm pretty happy with the folks I've got representing me in Congress and the Senate right now. Um, but... No matter who you are or where you live, if you're in the U.S. and you vote, um, you need to find these people, figure out who they are, follow them on social media is a good way to keep tabs on them, or they all have email lists you can subscribe to. Start paying attention to what they're up to, um, and I, I keep track of this now, which I didn't have to, you know, I could kind of let it all run on autopilot and say, yeah, it's being taken care of. But I don't think any of us can anymore. I think we need to be on top of this. We need to know what's being done in our name. And um, here's where you start doing that. Yeah, these are great sites. Mm -hmm. I know who my two senators are. Do you know, Dixon, who your senators are? No? Cory Booker and Robert Menendez. Two, two, two Democrats from New oh, Jersey. Um, Dix, uh, Alan's choice was play two websites where you can find your contact information for your senators and representatives. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Terrific. And you should know who they are. Who are they again? No, I knew. Uh, Cory Booker and Menendez. I, I knew those people. Cory used to be the mayor of Newark, and you met him, didn't you? No, I didn't meet him. I met his deputy mayor. I am sorry to say that I didn't meet him. I would have enjoyed meeting him. Dixon, do you have a pick? I do. And Kathy, you're going to love this pick. I, don't I know. love it already. Oh, good. Oh, good. I looked at it. Yes. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? I mean, this is Beautiful. like how yes. do animals evolve this way? I just don't know. But uh, there they are. 
This is a something called a princess spider, and I presume it's a member of the jumping spider group. And the, the markings on this animal are just not to be believed. It, they're psychedelic. Mm-hmm. It looks as though they, you know, they, uh, Joseph's uh, multicolored robe. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's just amazing. And they're um, beautiful. So I just thought that we could use a little beauty in this world every now and then. Not, nothing informational. Just somewhere out there, there's a beautiful spider that has attracted the attention of a photographer, and and, and he's willing to share that with us or she. So I, th- I thought this would make a nice little cheer me up type of thing. Yes. Yeah. Unless you're the, very if, nice. if you want to, if you want to amplify on how cheerful this is, yeah. you can Google peacock spider dance. Oh, good. Not only are these beautiful <laughs> little okay. spiders, okay. they do the, these poses that they're that they're doing in these photos. Yeah. That's their mating dance. Yeah. Um, so the male uh, comes up in front of the female and does this this whole routine <laughs> in order to impress her. Right. Um, and people have done videos of this. If you look up Peacock Spider Dance, people put this to music. Oh, so you nice. can see Peacock Spiders dancing <clears throat> and they'll they'll sound they'll they'll sync a soundtrack to it that uh, goes along that very too. nicely. Yeah, That's a lot of fun. How about that? I mean these are like bower birds uh, in that yeah. sense, right? They're very cool. It's amazing how nature has these recurrent themes no matter how if we consider this low one, the phylogenetic tree of life or high, uh, it's just part of the scale of life. Uh, there are beautiful, beautiful uh, episodes of animals uh, being nice to other animals, and that's what this is, I think. Yeah, I like this one where it's just, it really allows you to focus on what look like these blue green eyes, and there's two yeah. bigger ones, and then there's two <laughs> smaller ones exactly. on either side. Exactly. It's just did, you yeah. find, did you find this on Yahoo, Dixon? I did. Uh, yeah. What do you do when they go out of business? Um, I've subscribed to Cosmos magazine, so oh, that's I've got better. some other science that's a picks better. coming up. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? I chose, let's see, what did I choose? Oh, yes, <laughs> this article uh, that Harold Varmus wrote entitled, How Tumor Virology Involved into Cancer Biology and Transformed Oncology. And it's open access. And many of you remember that we had Harold Varmus on TWIV 400. He was very Harold eloquent 400 as a speaker, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> <laughs> very eloquent speaker and a very good writer, yeah. and it's captured yeah. the yeah, it's tumor virology story really nicely. That's right. I think a lot of this also he covered in that TWIV, didn't he? He did. Mm-hmm. He did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for those of you who like to read, yeah. If not, check out TWIV four hundred. Right. It was awesome. That's really That's right. good. Yeah, uh, Lynn Anquist sent this to me a couple of weeks ago. And I said, you should listen to the TWIV. (laughs) (laughs) I always try and promote these things. Absolutely. All right. Now, I have two picks. One is sad and the other is a little more lighthearted. (laughs) (laughs) You have to balance each other. And everyone Mm -hmm. knows that uh, this week Trump has proposed quite a substantial cut uh, from the National Institutes of Health budget, 18%. Five point eight billion dollars out of a budget that's about thirty five billion dollars, and so I have a New York Times article about it. But of course, you can find articles uh, just about anywhere. And in this Times article, um, uh, they have some nice quotes, and one I liked particularly is by, <clears throat> um, what's the guy's name, Dixon? I forgot. What's the guy's name, Dixon? Yeah, no, I know. That's not really useful. <laughs> uh, I how, how should I respond no, no, to that? No, no, Rush Holt. Sorry, Rush Holt. Rush Holt is a physicist, chief executive of uh, the AAAS. I have the feeling that he was a politician at one time, right? you got to be to become the head of the AAAS. Yes. Let's see. <laughs> um, Rush Holt, yeah, former U.S. representative. Sure. Well, I don't know why he quit. He should have stayed in there. Well, because um, he got disgusted, probably. He was from New Jersey. From was, New Jersey. He was a New Jersey representative. He's a Democrat. <clears throat> anyway, he says, uh, do they not think that there are advances to be made, improvements to be made in the human condition? The record of science research is so good after so many years. Who would want to sell it short? What are they thinking? Right. And that's the bottom line here. What are they thinking? What are they thinking? <clears throat> and I don't say this because I want to preserve you know, my career because – um, it's all about the, the greater it's good. It's over by now. It's over. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm limited. I know. It's over. Um, but even if it weren't over, um, right. I would still object because this is all about maintaining science, which is a great thing, as everyone knows. So, 
as Alan said, contact your senators and representatives and yes. tell them you want to support a full restoration of the NIH budget. Absolutely. Well, and it's not just the NIH budget. It's all of the science agencies that the really Center. matter most, EPA, um, NOAA, right. like just lots and lots of stuff NASA. that – it doesn't just – yeah, it funds an enormous amount of basic research, and so it's going to gut that. Um, on top of that, these are agencies that do vitally important work every day that saves lives, and that's all going to have to be on the chopping block. Um, it, this is just a, an absolutely ridiculous budget that right. – uh, and the reason this is being cut is to uh, provide tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans and to transfer military. something like $58 billion to the military, right. which is already larger than the next 10 largest militaries in the world combined. Correct. It's it, it's just completely off the charts how, how ridiculous this is. So, well, given the track well, record of presidents and their budgets submitted to Congress, how many of them have actually succeeded 100% in the right. well, they That's the point been I was going to make. None. They haven't been at a none. place like this, though. No, 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 Alan, yes, I can tell you. <laughs> but, too many oxes you know, gored on this one. <laughs> I was encouraged by the article I read in the New York Times, and I've just pulled one up. It may not be the same one, but... A representative Harold Rogers, a Republican of Kentucky, former chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, said, we will certainly review this budget proposal, but Congress ultimately has the power of the purse. Correct. However, um, this sets a mark that is so far out in right field Correct. that if they restore a few billion of it, they would then say, look how much better this budget is, but in fact, it would still be horrific. But I take the position that it's so far out in right field that they're not going to buy it. No. That would be nice. Um, maybe I'm just, Pollyanna, but I, you know, I, I, I would like I would like to believe that. But the reason I've included the contact information for your senators and representatives is that this is, um, yeah. <laughs> then we got the idea. And um, it's I guess there's been swings like this before in, in the past. Uh, trying to derail, say, for instance, the EPA and the Clean Water and the Clean Air Act. Oh, after. sure. There have been there have been little things along the way, comparatively. Um, but nothing but on this grand scale. Nothing, nothing on this grand a scale right, and across right, right. so many programs. And and the stuff that's being cut is just appalling in Alan, some cases. One of the biggest cuts here is going to be the Earth program from NASA. Oh, the Earth program from NASA. Yeah. So right. Meals on Wheels, if the you school lunch see, program. No, no, everything. of course. The but arts, it, the humanities. It's, it's it, incredibly it, transparent as to what's going on. These people yes. don't want you to see what they're doing to the planet. Of course. And the only way to, to cut that off is to cut off the eye in the sky, basically. Yes. right? But do you think NASA takes all this Mars money and says, oh, okay, we'll go to Mars. We won't, we won't look back at the Earth. You know what? I think we can decide not to go to Mars. We'll look back at the Earth until we get it right. They have the they have the mm -hmm. final option on this. Uh, I'm not sure how much leeway they have, but anyway, it's not it's not earmarked money. Now let me understand the money that's being cut from these programs or proposed to be cut would be used to fund the increase in the military budget. Is that <laughs> yes. right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. that's right. Well, uh, anyway, right. This is really unfortunate. And Medicaid, <clears throat> Planned Parenthood, etc. That's right. All right, my, but on a lighter note, another New York Times article, the lack <laughs> of an Ox, Oxford comma could cost a main company millions in overtime dispute. Just a quick punctuation lesson in a list of three or more items like beans, <coughs> potatoes, and rice. Some people would put a comma after potatoes. <laughs> Some would leave it out. That's the Oxford comma. A lot of people feel very, very strongly about it, including Jane Flint, who always puts a comma in. <laughs> I pretty much always do, too. I like yeah, I do, too. I do, I do like putting I the do. comma in there. Uh, anyway, there was, this was a case, uh, a class action lawsuit about overtime pay for truck drivers, which has hinged on the Oxford comma. <laughs> and the, if, you know, the, the, basically the state law says, overtime rules do not apply to the canning, processing, preserving, freezing, drying, marketing, storing, Packing for shipment or distribution of three different items, agricultural product, meat, perishable foods. And the lack of a comma after shipment makes it ambiguous. 
as to whether the exemption uh, <laughs> is for packing or distribution. And so that's what the lawsuit is all about. Dear, dear, dear. And it, it turns out that there have been other uh, lawsuits which have been settled for much money about similar placements of commas, which is quite interesting. Hmm. Reporters and editors at the Times usually omit the comma. <laughs> I know they do. <laughs> it's common in academic publishing. Anyway, it's a cool article. You should read. I can't, I can't find any of them right now, but somewhere I have collections of places where the lack of the comma just <laughs> makes hilarious phrases. And yeah, yeah. Well, I have this we, book which you may know of: uh, "Eats, Shoots, and Leaves." Yeah, yes. oh, right. That's a great book. <laughs> That's yeah. a great book. One. We yeah. have a sign out front that hangs over the. Um, uh, it hangs over for Washington Avenue, and it says in big brazen red letters, amazing things are happening here. Oh, yes, yes. So I put the comma after amazing. Someone did. <laughs> <laughs> someone someone did a graffiti on it. That's and, right. Yeah, they put a comma after amazing, and the dean was apparently very furious. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, that would refer to you, of course, the amazing things are what you're doing, right, Dixon? Oh, uh, no. no. Anyway, we have a couple of listener picks. We have one from Kim, who we read the letter of previously. I'd like to make a pick of the week. My pick is Tweevo number seven, Pigeon Fashion Week. <laughs> <laughs> Want to hear Vincent being giddy about something? Listen to this podcast. The science in the episode is amazing, and the guest, Mike Shapiro, is great. I'd probably rank Tweevo seven among the best episodes ever, together with Twim 51, Cave Science with Hazel Barton. Both episodes will surely give you new eyes regarding how you look at both caves and pigeons. Mm -hmm. Kim is from a snowless, crappy winter in Stockholm, of course. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, Richard, our dental friend from California, I believe. Check out Aeromorph from Tangible Media Group on Vimeo. Excuse me. <clears throat> Aeromorph is a uh, design simulation and fabrication pipeline for making transforming inflatables with various materials. It is just very cool how they make cool. these things. Very, very cool. <laughs> and I came, and also from Richard, I came across this project on the MIT Media Lab webpage. You may already have seen it. I continue to follow and recommend your podcasts. Foggy this morning in L.A. Bundle up. Hope the snow is not as bad as was predicted for your region. Hmm. Understanding molecular evolution. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen this. <clears throat> it's a project uh, overview uh, with videos, of course. So thanks for that, Richard. Mm -hmm. And then Johnny, our friend in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Before spring's warmth takes the beauty that can be found and made in winter's frigid cold, uh, Johnny sends a link to The Kids Should See This, um, an ice sculptor in Colorado. It's a movie of him <gasps> carving various things. <laughs> He's the founder of Ice Music in L Lulia, Swedish Lapland. Okay, that's very cool. Yes, mm -hmm. it's going to melt. And uh, Johnny also writes, there are perhaps two videos in this link from The Kid Should See This, One, is, which is the same website. One is about the invention of the Fahrenheit thermometer and the other about how the Celsius scale came about. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> in a very early <laughs> communication with TWIV, Professor R politely corrected my error when I referred to the temperature as something centigrade stating it was so many degrees Celsius. How embarrassing. No, not at all. <laughs> Best to all and stay appropriately dressed as our bipolar winter races away. <laughs> that is bipolar. Bipolar. Currently, right. it is an unseasonable 10 degrees Celsius in Boston. The story behind the Fahrenheit and Celsius. It's another video, of course. Right. So, Vincent, mm. did, you, did you see the article in the New York Times about how the storm this week probably ruined the cherry blossoms yep yep, yep. yep. <laughs> you didn't pick that one though <laughs> it, no it was too many i had two already that i wanted to bring up but um you know we won't have any for april right the of science walk is that true they'll be gone well, it's by supposed now? to be sooner than that anyway <clears throat> good it's supposed to be Excellent. pretty soon yeah this yeah. is why the storm probably ruined them because they're already in the bud form you know um when it was warm a few weeks ago, the gladiolas started coming up, right? They're, really, they're about six inches worth of shoots. And the crocuses. And too. the crocuses, and now they're all frozen. They croaked. Are they dead? No. The plant isn't dead, but the flower won't. It won't flower? Nope. Well, it depends. Some of them are pretty uh. tolerant. Yeah. 
I thought of you, Kathy, when I saw those angiosperms and and, uh, gladiolus Mm -hmm. coming out. Because we often uh, text pictures to each other when the first ones come out. I see. But it's already in February. It was a bit early, wasn't it? Yeah. (laughs) A bit, I'd say. Twiv 433. iTunes, Microbe TV, microbe.tv slash Twiv. And if you have a smartphone or a tablet. Dixon, do you have a smartphone? Well, it's definable by who uses it, and the answer is I have a I have a phone, and I know it does things. And <laughs> Smart I don't use it, hold all it. the things that it all can right. do, but I do. Anyway, you so. can have it. You, there's apps on that. There are apps on that there phone are. that uh, you can use to grab podcasts. You can this subscribe and get them for free. I'd like you all to subscribe to uh, Twiv. Well, you already do. Tell everyone to subscribe to Twiv. <laughs> and uh, if you'd like to help us out, microbe.tv slash contribute, Patreon, for example. Um, hmm. PayPal, etc. We'd love to have your financial support. But we understand if you can't. And finally, send us questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. Dixon de Palmier can be found at thelivingriver.org. Yes. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. Yes. Trichinella.org. Yep. Medicalecology.com. That's true. Verticalfarm.com. Yep. Wow, you have a veritable... Vincent, Empire of without you, media. I would be nothing. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> I, I am limited, as you said this morning. But not by much. <laughs> Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, worms is what did it, right? Worms got me turned on, boy. They, they, are, they do it for me. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> and Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He's also Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Rack in Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the sponsor of this show, Blue Apron. The music you hear at the beginning of TWIV is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.